Good morning, everyone. So welcome to New City Church, the office edition. My name is Kevin Ha. I'm one of the pastors here at New City Church. Um, today is Palm Sunday. So as we talked about earlier, we remember the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem. And by the way, for those of you who are slightly OCD about our order, we will do communion after the sermon. <laughs> Um, it, it is intentional. You'll see why. Um, this is the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem and into the temple, culminating in his crucifixion on Friday and resurrection on Sunday. So I want to encourage all of you to treat this week holy. This is an important week in which uh, we have been thinking about our own darkness, our own sin, our own pain, our own issues for the last 30 somewhat days. And as we go towards the end of Lent, I want us to now um, think about what Jesus has done for us. See, we come to that place that when, when we realize that, it, you know, we really can't fix our own problem, fix our own darkness. Yes, to a certain extent, yes, but ultimately, we do not have the solutions to the vicious cycle of sin in our lives and the darkness that we face. There is no hope on our own. And so we come to that realization. As we come to that realization, now we look to Jesus who comes to save us. And that's what this week is about. So I want to encourage you to come to the Monday Thursday. Um, it's a wonderful time of washing uh, one another's feet um, and, um, and remembering the Last Supper. Uh, come to the Good Friday service. We have a fantastic, uh, special uh, Good Friday service prepare um, in which we remember the last seven uh, uh, words of Jesus, uh, as well as go through uh, the Stations of the Cross through the artwork of Kevin Raleigh. Um, and then the Saturday, the Holy Saturday Labyrinth. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the Easter Sunday. Uh, the, the Sunday of the resurrection. So I want to invite you to um, ask your friends and ask your family members to join you for Easter celebration service. If people have any kind of church history in their childhood, uh, oftentimes, you know, Easter is a possible Sunday. You know, the Easter Christmas Christians, you know, they are more likely, people are more likely to say yes to an invitation to an Easter service than any other time. Uh, and so... Um, Invite them, uh, and oftentimes, if you don't invite them, they don't know where to go. They don't have any connections to it. So may I just spend, um, may I just ask you to pray just for a few seconds now, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to place in your heart um, names of people that maybe you should invite. Lord, um, we thank you. Help us to have the boldness and, um, and, and the gentleness and the love to invite them to this celebration. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to just encourage you to you know, write that email, text that person, call that person, knock on that door to say, hey, come on over. And also, if they have kids, invite them to the Easter Fest and invite, you know, give them the free ticket and uh, invite them to come. Um, so uh, also remember that services are at 9 and 11 at LATC next week. So please don't get confused by that. Um, so we are concluding our sermon series today called Through the Darkness. It's been a series about common human affliction. It, and the theme of this Lent series is that we are called to go through the darkness rather than to deny it or hide it or avoid it, but to go through it, to face it. And as we come to the conclusion of this series, um, we will now look to see how God saves us from our darkness. 
So that's the, that's the theme today. How does God save us from our darkness? And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna look at the story of the Passover from uh, Exodus, from the Old Testament, and also from um, the New Testament when Jesus celebrated the Passover. For 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, uh, Apostle Paul tells us that for Christ... Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So that's the title of the sermon today. Christ, our Passover lamb. You know, the Passover, the Jewish Passover and the Holy Week is deeply connected. Did you ever wonder why the date of Easter keeps on changing? You know, sometimes it's in March. Yeah, sometimes it's in early April. Some, this year is kind of late, April 21st. Um, because it's connected to Passover. You know, somebody asked the rabbi, Rabbi, why, why does the Passover keep changing from year to year? And pass, the rabbi said, no, it never changes. It's always on, uh, always on the 14th of Nisan. Nisan is a month in the Jewish calendar. It's always on the 14th of Nisan. But it just happens that 14th, on a, uh, a 14th of Nisan is also a different day on a Gregorian, our Western calendar that we use. So that's why it keeps on changing, okay? So it's because it's pegged to the Passover. And sun, um, Palm Sunday is on the 10th of Nisan. Today, if you're a Jew, you would say it's the 10th of Nisan. Not the car, it's the month, all right? Keep thinking, car. And you know what? We're going to read a passage today that talks about the 10th of Nisan. 10th of Nisan is a very special day. It is the day that they are commanded to acquire, purchase the lamb for the Passover. And then for four days, they are called to examine the lamb to make sure that it's perfect, it's blemishless, because that's the requirement. And then on the 14th of Nisan, Thursday, begins the Passover celebration. We will see that Passover actually teaches us how Christ faced our darkness to save us from our darkness. Ultimately, today's sermon is about how much God loves us. God loves you. As I said, uh, during Lent, we're, we've been focusing on ourselves, in, in a way, our sense of repenting and digging deep and facing our own darkness. We've heard some great messages from Cindy on loneliness, from um, Tracy on, on rejection, bitterness. We, we talked about uh, emotional pain. We talked about anxiety. Uh, we talked about greed that permeates into our hearts. We've been talking about things in our lives that causes us to be lost, causes us to feel like we're in darkness. But as we enter into the Holy Week, as we face our darkness, as we acknowledge it, as we see the depth of it, we now are called to focus on God's love for us. And that's what we're going to do today. And that's what I encourage you to do this week. This week is about now seeing God's love for us. He did not leave us in darkness. He came and demonstrated his love for us. And I want you to see this week and today how profound God's love for you is, how amazing it is, how deep it is, how, how surprising it is, how utterly captivating it is, how compelling it is. I want you to see that. And that's my prayer for you. As Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19, he says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's what we're trying to get to. It's not just about seeing our darkness and trying to figure it out. Now, we're going to Jesus and seeing his love for us. Seeing the depth of his love for us. And I want us to dig into today's passage and come to that deep appreciation of God's love for us as we look to see what he has done for us. See, in Christianity, it's not about digging into our heart, figuring out our problem, and then fixing it, and then God blessing us. That's not the gospel. The gospel is looking deep into our hearts, seeing our problem, seeing our mess, seeing our issue, and coming to God and saying, Lord, I try, but I can't do it on my own. I can't, I can't fix myself. I'm stuck. And now we come to see God's love, what he has done for us to redeem us. You see, what he has done for us to redeem us is not of us. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about what he has done in a moment in history. It's actually, that, that's why the today's, today's uh, sermon is going to dig into what actually happened in a moment in history, that Holy Week, that Good Friday, that Monday Thursday, okay? So let's go to Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 13. We don't have a screen, so uh, you can open it up in your Bible, your app, uh, whatever. New City Church 1 is the password if you want access to the Wi-Fi here. Um, but let me give you a little bit of a context before we read today's passage about the Passover story. The, the people of Israel were in slavery in Egypt for about 400 years. And they grew in number during that time. And they cried out for freedom. They cried out to God to deliver them from the bondage of slavery. And God heard their cry and started, to, started the process of liberating his people. The New, Test, New Testament teaches us that the story of the liberation of the people of Israel from slavery is a story of God's liberation of us from our bondage, our slavery, to the vicious cycle of sin and darkness that we encounter in our lives. So God sent Moses to free the people of Israel from slavery. But Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was not about to uh, release his free labor force. So God used Moses to send 10 plagues to Egypt. Often, uh, Pharaoh conceded after a really bad plague, but then he changes his mind and backs out. And God sent his last plague, the 10th plague and the protection against it. And that's the story today. The 10th plague is the severest, the death of the firstborn. And this is when Passover is introduced. So let's read Exodus 12, verses 1 to 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month. The first month of your year. Tell the whole assembly of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, and that's Nisan, that's today, 10th. So we have a Bible verse that actually talks about today. 10th, month, 10th day of this month, Nisan. Each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for, his, one for each household. If any household is too small for the whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of the lamb needed in accordance, with, in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. 
take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. This is bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some of it is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat. You are to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So this is the first time it's introduced. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So on the night of the Passover, the Lord struck down every firstborn, both men and animals. Why? It says in verse 12, as a judgment on all gods of Egypt. This is an act of judgment of God on all gods of Egypt. The gods of Egypt were probably the force that were holding, uh, that was holding Israelites in slavery. Maybe it was the building of their shrines or the pyramids for the dead, according to their gods, that because of it, if they're, honor, if they're honoring their god, they would never, ever let the people who are building the shrines go. Some... Um, you know, because these shrines or the pyramid could not be built without them. And some scholars indicate that the firstborn was the representative of the family and had a special significance in the religious practice of the Egyptian gods. And Yahweh, Yahweh is the God of Israel. Yahweh was striking at the heart of their gods. Whatever the reason... You would think that the judgment of God should be reserved for the Egyptians, the, the enemies, the, the people who are keeping the Israelites in bondage. But for some reason, it was not. Unless the blood of the lamb was on the door frame, Yahweh would destroy the firstborn, even of the Israelites. Only if the blood of the lamb was on the door frame, Yahweh would pass over those houses. What this tells us is that the judgment of God is real and exact. There is a wrath of God against evil and sin. Because God is a God of justice. What is interesting is that while the just judgment was against the gods of Israel, you know, against slavery, or against evil forces, against the nation that killed Israel's babies. There was an infanticide going on of Israel's babies to control the, their population. But it wasn't safe for anyone, including the Israelites, without the blood of the Lamb. Maybe some of us lived a life um, like the Egyptians and kind of feel that we deserve God's judgment and wrath upon us. But maybe some of us grew up in the church and, you know, and we don't think we're all that bad. But you know what? Wherever you are in your spectrum, no one can stand the judgment of God 
because the wage of sin is death, the scripture tells us. And that's what the passage here is teaching us. God's standard is holy. No one can live up to God's standard. Only hope we have, we have is the lamb whose blood is shed for us. The lamb has to be perfect. It had to be acquired on the 10th of Nisan, the first month. And it had to be slaughtered on the 14th of Nisan. For four days, they were to examine it and make sure that it doesn't have any defects. Passover, the Passover teaches us that the blood of the spotless, blameless, perfect lamb can substitute for the life of the firstborn, the life of the family. A perfect lamb could deliver us from the righteous judgment of God. You know, God thought that this was so important that he repeats this over and over again throughout the Torah, the Pentateuch, the, the first five books of the Old Testament, and, and throughout the scriptures. And he repeatedly tells the Hebrew people to observe the Passover, to remember the Passover. Remember that the blood of the lamb can save and redeem us. Later on in the desert, so they're free, and, uh, and they're in the desert on their way to the promised land, circling around actually. Yahweh commands the people of Israel to build a tabernacle, which is a tent-like temple. It's a temporary temple. At the heart of the tabernacle is the Holy of Holies. It was a place that represented the actual presence of the Holy God. In it was the Ark of the Covenant. You know, if you've seen the Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's what that story was fictionally about. It represented the presence of God. And on the Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur, Jewish people, uh, it's, it's the high holy days for the Jewish people. Um, and, um, and once a year, they, they still celebrate this once a year, and, but they don't do this part anymore. Uh, the chief priest would enter the Holy of Holies with the blood of a perfect, blemishless lamb. God was again showing us that we can only enter his presence with blood. The blood of the lamb. Every time the Hebrew people went to the temple, every time they atoned for their sins in a day of atonement, they were called to remember that they cannot stand on their own merits. A substitute, a lamb must be slain for their sins. And fast forward about 1,500 years. Prophet Isaiah was prophesying about the Messiah to come in Isaiah. In Isaiah 57, 7, 53, 7 says, talking about the Messiah. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And then let's fast forward a few hundred years. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, this is what John said in John chapter 1, verse 29. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the one who is slain as a substitute for us. He is the Lamb of God. In you know, 1 Peter 1.18, um, Apostle Peter explains this further. He says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed to you from your ancestors. 
It's not because of money, silver, gold, whatever you did. It's not because of that that you could be saved from your mess, your darkness. That's what he's saying. Verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. It says we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus, a lamb without blemish or defect. What's more amazing is that this, maybe it's not more amazing, but another interesting fact is that this passage says that God knew even before the creation of the world that Jesus would be the lamb. If God knew beforehand that Jesus would be the lamb. This passage in Exodus that we've been reading must be written to point to Jesus. Remember the lamb. Watch for the lamb. Watch for the lamb. Only, only through the lamb. Then it was announced when Jesus appeared, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and the temple on the 10th of Nisan. The date that under the Passover commands that we are supposed to acquire the lamb. He entered into Jerusalem on that particular day, on this particular day, Palm Sunday, because he's saying to the world, I am the lamb of God. To take away the sin of the world. And people welcome them with cloak and palm branches. Palm branches, I think, comes more from the tradition because, you know, that's people put down palm branches and said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And and that Sunday, Jesus came and entered into the temple. And the reason that the temple was so busy, remember there were money changers, people selling all kinds of stuff at the temple courtyard. The reason that it was busy was because it's Passover. People are there to buy sheep, buy the Passover lamb. Because if they buy it from outside, you know, the priest would say, oh, it's not good enough. There's too many defects. So they have to buy it on the inside if they want. And if they're going to buy it on the inside, they have to change into the currency of the temple. And they got ripped off there. They got ripped off by buying the temple sheep. There was a scam going on. And Jesus gets really ticked off. He gets angry. And he cleans out the merchants in the temple. Because the lamb has come to the temple. There is a process of cleansing. And he cried out, my house will be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of robbers. The point is that Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan because he was the Passover lamb. And then for four days, he was examined by everyone. The religious leaders and Pharisees and Sadducees and all the other C's. <laughs> And Essenes, whatever. All these people came and questioned him and tested him. It's like looking for defects on the lamb. And they tried to trick him. They tried to find faults in Jesus, but they could not find any. And on the 14th day of Nisan, the beginning of the Passover, Jesus had his Passover dinner with his disciples. Let's catch that story in Mark chapter 14, verse 12. Mark chapter 14, verse 12. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, that was another name for the Passover festival, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparation for you to eat the Passover? And we're going to skip down to verse 16. 
The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. So we know that that dinner, the Last Supper, as we remember them, is the Passover dinner. Verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it, uh, drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a sim, uh, hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So this dinner is the Passover dinner. And usually... In the Passover dinner, there is a presider who explains the significance of the dinner and various different elements of the dinner. It's a very intentional dinner. If you've ever been to a Jewish Seder, you know, say that's the Passover meal. Um, they still um, do many of these things. And Jesus is the presider of the dinner. He took the bread, the unleavened bread. A bread without any yeast whatsoever. And that's why that unleavened bread is not, has not risen because there's no yeast. Because it symbolizes purity, perfection. And instead of saying this is the bread of affliction, of slavery in Egypt. That's what they usually say in a Seder dinner, in a Passover dinner. Jesus said, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and instead of saying that the cup represents the deliverance from Egypt, he said, this is my blood. So there is this unleavened bread and the cup. But where is the lamb? I mean, where is the Passover lamb in the Last Supper? What kind of a Passover dinner is this? There's no lamb on the table. There is, the lamb is not on the table. The lamb is at the table. Jesus is the lamb of God. Now, why is it so important to understand that Jesus is the Passover lamb? So what? you say? saying, thank you for the historical lesson. It's, it's mildly interesting, Pastor Kevin. But so what? You might say. God loved us so much that he came down. In fact, he chose to come down to this world even before the creation of the world, not to judge us, not to, to whip us, not, not to hurt us, but to be our Passover lamb. Now, this is not some divine child of you, some people say it is. It is it's, it's not God, the Father, whipping his son and go, you take the punishment for their sins. It is God himself who comes down in Jesus and who takes our place and becomes the sacrificial lamb. He came down to be judged, to be humiliated, to be mocked, to be spat upon, to be beaten, to be abandoned, to be rejected, to be lonely, to be filled with our anxieties, to be filled with our pain, to be filled with all of our darkness, to be crowned with the crown of thorns, to be whipped until he collapsed to be nailed to the cross, to be pierced 
by a spear, to be crucified, to be slaughtered as a lamb, our Passover lamb, to redeem us, to reconcile us to God, to free us from slavery, to give us liberty and freedom, to give us a new life, to bring us into his presence, to give us eternal life, joy, peace, and love. This is about God's love for you. This is how he showed how much he loves you. God's love for you is not just this abstract, positive energy love that flows. There is that element of that. But it's more than that. God actually comes down and takes upon our darkness upon himself and suffers as our substitute. That's how much God loves you. Would you meditate on that love this week? As you think about how he washed his disciples' feet, would you think about his love for us? Would you think about how he became the Passover lamb? We should think about his love for us. As you think about the cross and how he died for us, now he suffered for us, would you see his love for you? Would you meditate on his love for you? No matter how dark your afflictions are, Christ has come to save you. Would you meditate on his love for you? Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is a demonstration of his love for you. Do you want to know how much God loves you? Look at the cross. Look at what he has done for you. Look what he has planned for you. Look, look, what, what, look at the suffering. That is how much he loves you. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. I pray that this love of God, as demonstrated on the cross, would sink deep into your soul this week. Meditate on it. Be intentional about it. Your darkness cannot be solved. Ultimately, maybe a little bit. But ultimately, you end up in a vicious cycle of darkness. No matter how hard you try, we are powerless. Only in Christ Jesus, in his redeeming love for us as a Lamb of God. Only when we hold on to that love and let, let the love of God saturate us. And you know, the thing is, because we've been thinking about our own darkness his love is even greater. His grace is even more amazing, right? What he has done for us is even more powerful. Let the love of God permeate deep into your soul. Let's, we're going to go to the table now. But as we do that, I want us to spend a moment in meditation. Just, I want, I want you to just meditate and think, God loves me. God loves me. He demonstrated his own love for me by dying for me. I want to invite you to take his body and blood because he is the lamb who was slain for our sins. If you want to believe this, if you believe this, we invite you to take the body and the blood. It would be, we're going to pass it out to you because it's a smaller room and so it'd be passed around. Take 
and then uh, we will partake together. At the cross you begin me draw me gently to my knees and I am lost for words so lost in love I'm sweetly broken holy surrender at the cross you begin me draw me gently They ate the lamb at the Passover dinner. And Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins to take away the sins of the world let us take you know it's no longer on the doorpost the blood of the lamb it is ingested it is inside of us. I believe that, in a way, the power of what he has done for us, the power of his love for us, goes in us, inside of us, and becomes for us the power to live. Apostles regularly talked about the power of God that is in us. It's not some inspiration that we get because we get some godly inspiration. It's literally because we have ingested what he has done for us. We have ingested the body of Christ and the blood of Jesus. We now have the power to prevail. Power to be close to Jesus, power to soak in his arms, power to learn, power to be embraced by him, because as we do so, our darkness fades. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you. You thank you that you came and live among us. You shared your life with us. Then you became our lamb, our Passover lamb. You demonstrated your love for us in such concrete ways and you told us to remember, remember, remember I am the lamb and remember every Sunday, every time you gather, every time you eat, remember to ingest me, my body and blood because that is power for you. So Lord, Heavenly Father, help us to live out 
the power of the love of Christ demonstrated to us on the cross. And as we do so, help us to prevail over our darkness and help us to take steps to prevail over the darkness of this world and bring compassion and justice and gr grace wherever we step into. Thank you, Jesus. And this week, oh Lord, help us to just soak in this and remember this. Help us to make this week a special week, oh Lord, of remembering your love, what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.